What you see is not always what you see. Um, I live in a little village outside of Bradford, and over the road is a farm, and we get our milk delivered every day from our cows. But it's a cow with a difference. I come from England, which is still, at the moment, attached to Europe. We haven't quite left it yet, and maybe by the end of the month, we will find out. <laughs> but to put it into context, uh, Bradford is... In, well, I'm getting a lot of hum. <laughs> yeah. It is um, in the centre of England, or the British Isles. So you've got Scotland and Wales and the Isle of Ma uh, John O'Groats at the bottom. And Bradford Royal Infirmary is in the west of Yorkshire. And this is our Lizzing for Life Centre. And if you look behind you, you can see the rest of the hospital, but I don't really need to show you that. So Doug gave me this context of the role of the balloon eustachian tube, uh, tube, tuberplasty in treating eustachian tube dysfunction. So we're going to talk on some basics of anatomy, physiology, pathophysiology, the diagnosis of ETs, the, the procedure itself, and then hopefully discussion. And of course, with anatomy, this is one of the powerhouses of Gray's uh, anatomy. It comes from Seattle. And you're all going to groan. You've all got to start with embryology. And obviously, the tube comes from Eustatius, but uh, yeah, that was in the the elms of uh, Queen Elizabeth. So it goes back a, a, a few years. It's surprising what these people used to get up to. But Valsalva actually honored his anatomical processes to Eustatius, and he gave the name Eustatian tube. And gradually over the years, embryology, through animal experiments and observations, realized how it all began. And you all going to groan, you know, first pharyngeal cleft brings back memories, first pharyngeal pouch, that also becomes the, the external artery meatus, and the pouch becomes the middle ear and the eustachian tube, and the little blob of mesokine becomes your ossicles. So that sets the scene of where it all starts. There's been some very good radiological studies by uh, uh, Tyson people, and I think some of it's fairly obvious in the sense that the, the length of the child's uh, eustachian tube is smaller, it's more horizontal, it's, it's wider in lumen, it's straighter, and the process of maybe getting things up the tube may be related to why children are more prone to otitis media and infections. We tried to get our radiologist to look at it, and it's actually very difficult to do radiology of the eustachian tube all in one go, especially when you're getting you know, coronal normal sagittal axial uh, uh, dissections. You have to play around with it and get the, the slopes and the angles together. So it's, uh, you, have, you have to be a bit of an art to uh, fathom out how to do this. I haven't got a, a pointer, so you'll have to bear with me. Look, the process there. We tried to mimic the angle in an adult, but we couldn't get a child that we had a scan to get it horizontal enough. But you have to take my word for it that it does lay, lay fairly, uh, fairly flat. Important relationships are related to the middle ear. See, the bony process is like a funnel, widest in the middle ear coming down to the isthmus and the junction of the cartilaginous portion and relationship to the skull base. The important bit that we're dealing with is the cartilaginous eustachius tube, and this protrudes into the uh, nasopharynx at the torus toberinus. And again here, the of Rosenbola, it wouldn't be without exploring the process that the lining of the eustachian tube is in connection both with the middle ear and with the nasopharynx is a pseudo-stratified respiratory epithelium containing 
mucous glands and globulate cells and lots of little villi to um, yeah, collect the secretions. But Rettinger, going into the dark Europe, um, did some lovely work. And at the top here is the tube is supposed to be open all the, all the time, uh, but usually contains mucus. One interesting process, really, from the surgical point of view, is the relationship with the internal carotid artery. And it's just at the junction of the isthmus, the bony and cartilaginous process. So it is important that if people putting instruments in there, that there is maybe more than a theoretical risk of a damage to the internal carotid artery. And it, I don't know whether there's been any side effects to um, balloon plasty to a rupture of the, uh, the carotid artery, but there's well recognized anatomical dissections of dehiscence of, of bone and things. The anatomy is quite important. This is my sort of own home di diagrams that are made. The LL is the lateral lamella and the medial lamella of the cartilage. OFP is uh, Osterman's uh, fat pad, and the two muscles that really are associated with the eustachian tube is the levator veli palatini and the tensor veli palatini. In a different format, they're suspended from the skull base, and again, bringing back the horrors of your anatomy, the, the, the hook of the hamulus, the um, that the tensor vela palatini comes down into the, into the hard palate, and everything's suspended from the, the, from the skull base. How does it all work? Well, it's obviously the tensor muscles open up the, the tube, and this comes on with swallowing, uh, usually from a you know, voluntary uh, movement of those muscles. Physiology is important. It has three main functions. It's the aeration, the opening and allows the equalization of atmospheric pressure to the middle ear, and its closure protects unwanted uh, pressure changes or fluctuations and loud sounds going into the middle ear. Drainage, uh, the middle ear mastoid, uh, like, like your sinuses, is producing mucus all the time and drains it from the middle ear down into the postnasal space. And you know, theoretically, uh, obviously, in the, in the child, it's well recognized that it doesn't necessarily protect infections ascending to the middle ear, but has a probably better anatomical process because of the bends in the isthmus and uh, the theoretical closure of the cartilaginous pause portion during uh, the adult. So if you have abnormal function, the process is the tube is closed at rest. Um, loud sounds are uh, dampened. Uh, so, sorry, in, in, the impaired ventilation is um, leads to the hearing loss in otitis media. Poor ventilation will lead to retraction, atelectasis, and obviously to the theories of formation of cholesteatoma and other diseases. The converse of a closed eustachian tube is the patulous tube. And there is those features of otophony. People describe that they hear their voices um, and getting lots of air pressures and things every time they're swallowing, their ears are crackling and popping all, all the time. This uh, is relatively uh, common. We see, certainly see it in adults who rapidly lose weight in cancer patients and probably in patients who have had radiotherapy to the postnasal space. It's a little bit controversial whether or not it's actually got anything to do with the Osterman's uh, fat pad. Uh, certainly from regiological uh, points of view, the, uh, it, it, on MRI scanning, uh, there's sometimes no change in the, in the fat in the, in, the, in the T2 signals. But um, you know, people would think about 
loss of weight related to loss of the, the, uh, the fat content. But we're talking about tube plastic. The process of dabbling with the eustachian tube goes back many, many years, back to, in fact, the 18th century. And there's various processes here that you can think of are, are, are quite common. In the fact that you're trying to uh, do polycerization, they're trying to put tubes up there to ventilate your ears. Um, they realized that the state of the eustachian tube was needed for ventilation to be able to hear correctly. And catheterization in item five was the first step before using myringotomies. I'm not too sure when they actually invented the, the grommet. So the whole prerequisite of air in the middle ear and hearing goes back a long, long time. The balloon. Try to look up um, consensus statements, and there's certainly nothing in the American Academy that I could come across. But we have an organization called NICE, National Institute of Health and Clinical Excellence, and it's an independent body that review treatments to see whether or not they are clinically uh, effective, uh, maybe cost effective, and whether or not they are suitable for commissioning. Now, a lot of times you have uh, pre-treatment statements, people uh, fish for the process, and in 2011, NICE came up with the uh, principles of eustachian tube balloon dilatation, and they describe what it's about, and the aim was to dilate the tube without structural damage is the outcome there. Efficacy in those days, small case reports, as you can see, eight patients in one, uh, follow-up only for eight weeks, and probably uh, an improvement in function. A case series of 30 patients, um, but their you know, symptoms of fullness, uh, follow-up time was not stated. And the special advisors listed uh, outcomes as improvement of tubal function, resolution of symptoms, and fluid drainage of the middle ear. Now, they came across, obviously, safety is an important issue, and there was nothing, uh, no adverse events reported in the literature, but obviously mucosal tears, the cartilaginous portion, but the theoretical risk could be rupture of the internal carotid artery, uh, conductive hearing loss, damage to the eustachian tube scarring, and stenosis and ear infection or pain was all the theory that was put forward. And to this day, nothing has changed. Not, no new data has come, come forward. And uh, groups in Cambridge are doing a lot of work and collaborating with uh, Dennis Poe uh, here in the United States. But it's still not particularly commissioned there's a few hospitals do do it in small numbers. But I think if you all look into the post-nasal space, your station tube comes in all shapes and sizes. How do we evaluate the station tube dysfunction? Well, there's a plethora of tests, but how well do they, they function? Uh, we all know about the Valsalva, you know, hold your nose and puff your cheeks out. The tombi is the reverse, you hold your nose and swallow. Um, tympanometry, which I'm sure we all have access to, uh, but you have a good breath in, a good sniff out, and you can change, uh, change the curves. There's a lot of variation. Uh, Tuber tympanometry uh, has a fixed standard pressure, or various pressures to the, post to the uh, nasopharynx and you're watching the pressure changes in the external audio canal. Um, sonar tubinometry, putting sounds up, uh, it's fairly specialized. I don't know how many units would have, have that in the United Kingdom, only probably two or three, I think, are the best. And then tubo, uh, tubo impedance is 
using different pressures and looking at the peak middle ear uh, impedance pressures. So they're looking at how well the middle ear is, is working. In uh, 2011, I think, um, the eustachian tube dysfunction questionnaire, the seven uh, symptoms, if you can read that, is pressure in the ears, pain in the ears, feeling your ears are clogged, ear problems when you have a cold or sinusitis, crackling, popping sounds, ringing in the ears, and feeling that your hearing is muffled. And you score that divided by, you add it all up, divided by seven, and you get the ETDQ7. Uh, this is a patient reported outcome measure, which was reported, reported as being highly sensitive and specific, but it doesn't really detect or distinguish between a patchless uh, eustachian tube and a closed eustachian tube. I thought I was doing quite well in getting all the papers out and it's, it, it, the papers were all very positive. And at Christmas time, November, this uh, uh, paper by Matthew Smith and colleagues so it came out, so well, what is the diagnostic accuracy of sorting out eustachian tube dysfunction? And it is um, it really sort of blew everything up that what we've been looking at it really has to go back to square one and rethink again. This study looked at uh, two patient reported outcomes. One is the uh, ED questionnaire, and the other one was one developed by the Cambridge Addenbrooke's hospitals. And then they looked at other 14 tests of function, some of the, which I've just had on the previous side. Uh, nine of them were to do with uh, eustachian tube opening, and five were connected with patulous tubes. And it was a case-based study, uh, complex processes of assessment, but the scenarios were given to um, experts in the field uh, throughout in, in, in the world, and they had to adjudicate what the results interpreted. And they came out that the patient reported outcomes, which have been used as one of the gold standards for reporting, actually have very poor specificity and felt there's no diagnostic value at all. Um, tests of eustachian tube function have a marginal degree of uh, benefit. And this latent class analysis suggested that uh, tympanometry, sonotubinometry, and tubomanometry or tubo impedance were had potential value needed to be looked into in greater greater detail. At the same time, um, a lot of the previous papers had been retrospective case reports, no concrete or standardization of the presenting symptoms, multitude of uh, problems of glue ears or fullness, and uh, you couldn't really get a handle of what they were trying to do, but they all said the patients got better. There was no uh, lack of controlled trials, no disclosure on some of them about who sponsored it, whether they're getting uh, remuneration from the, the, the companies and things like that. So this uh, paper by Mayer, again, at, at, at the end of uh, last year, I thought this is, I started off and it looked good. One-to-one um, -one patient randomization. We had 31 in the treatment group going for balloon and 29 in the control, all satisfying a score of greater than three in the uh, seven questionnaire eustachian tube uh, process. But they haven't read the uh, Matthew Smith's paper at that stage. And they start off and at six weeks, they get re-evaluated and of the 29, there's a few lost to follow up or were happy or got better. And, but 23 of those 29 satisfied the crossover. 
So everybody then goes to have balloon dilatation. So I'm thinking, hang on, who's going to then be the control? But they then report on the control of the individual patient's pre-treatment condition. I think we all appreciate that eustachian tube function does vary, but we didn't know what the pathology of what they were testing, you know, what was going on behind the scenes. Um, so there was no blinding, and we don't know how you can allow for placebo effect. If somebody's having a treatment, you know, you, you, the questionnaire is you're going to help the doctor. You're going to say yes to the doctor all the time. Now, one or two things that rose some concerns was if you're putting a tube into your station tube, could you be producing a pressure effect? And they measured it, but the answer is there was no damage, no problems. So putting the unflated tube into the eustachian tube, pressurizing it, depressurizing it, and removing it, so like getting a, a suction effect, had no physiological <coughs> changes. So this is what it looks like. This is a gentleman who had it done under a local anesthetic, and the fine going around, finding the eustachian tube orifice on the right-hand side, a probe. Going right up to the, the isthmus area, and then the balloon is uh, slid along the tube. And then you have to hold the, the balloon firmly against it and then you blow it up, otherwise there's a tendency for the balloon to pop out. And in that other paper, the, it was the physician's choice as to the size and the length of the tube, so there's no standardization of what's going on. It's kept in place for two minutes, and that, that's all you need to do. So that is the end of the talk, but what we want to do is discuss, of the people who have had experience, what are you actually treating? If you've got middle ear disease or fluid there, are we going to say that balloon dilatation is a new treatment or we're using grommets? What, what are the symptoms that you would think out of that that most of the papers use would be suitable for balloon eustachian tube tuberplasty? I rest my case because the question is, what are the standards and what are we trying to evaluate at the end of the day?